if somebody's thinking about being a doctor, um, what could they or should they study undergraduate? And um, I'm, I'm talking about being a dentist. Well, this is an interesting question because what are the graduate medical schools looking for? In dental, and you just answer what, what, what fits you. But um, in terms of the U.S. schools, they're very competitive. But what sort of what do they want from a student well, they accept? With um, medical schools and dental schools, um, and I went through all of the fun of the application process in the uh, late '80s for um, dental school, and for residency was in the early '90s. Uh, basically. The majority of, of people, when they go into undergrad, they're either a chemistry, physics, or biology major, but that is not a requirement. Uh, my One of my best friends from undergrad was English Lit, and uh, he's in private practice and, f and family practice in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. So as long as you have to take the required science courses uh, that give you the knowledge and the background to take the MCAT or DAT. Those are like the equivalent of the SAT, but for the next level. And um, uh, but it's not it's it's not a prerequisite to be a biology major like I was. Uh, in fact, they um, when you get to the if if you get to the interview process, um, they, they don't talk about you know oh how did you like organic chemistry? You know it's it's the first question I got when I was interviewing for dental schools was well Greg tell me uh, what book have you read recently? And I was like I was like oh great you know but so and they they're really into. Um, Extracurricular activities, uh, um, hand skills, dexterity is very important. Uh, painting, sculpting, for, for me it was the drums. Um, uh, so they really like music, um, art, uh, things like that are, are very, very important um, in terms of setting yourself aside in terms of you know having great grades as a chemistry major. So, But the people that really succeed are the people that uh, get along with everybody. Uh, have that, that emotional intelligence. This is where the Asian kids, frankly, fall down and fall down pretty bad. There's a lot of PhD, Asian PhDs in America who can't get a job. And it's one of those things which is not talked about very much in the educational system in Hong Kong, but it's real true. And the reason is, if you walk on, look on the MTR and you see the kids, eight, nine, ten years old, traumatized, studying their, whatever they're studying, uh, this is the wrong approach. You have to get into clubs. You have to stay active in team sports. Those kids who do well, uh, even in the medical field, and, the, and who wind up being in management positions and have thriving practices where other people work for them, uh, are the ones who get along best with people and can communicate. It's even, even surgeons. The top surgeons are not necessarily the top technicians. They're the ones who can talk to the other guys and women and get along with them and engender faith in what they're going to be doing. So uh, my big thing would be for, for all the kids in, in coming out of Asia would be uh, back off a little bit on the academics and spend more time playing sports, uh, joining clubs, learning instruments, being part of the team, learning how to get along with other people, and you'll be a much bigger hit in the, in the U.S. when you're done with your education. Yeah, um, I'd like to add to that, and parents might want to shoot me after I say this, but tell your kids if they go to college in the United States to get into a fraternity or a sorority. Not for the partying, but the but just the, the social relationships and the friendships that I developed in college. The, my best friends today are were Sigma News at Furman, and uh, you know one's a conductor of a symphony, uh, several are doctors, attorneys. Uh, the the social skills and your ability to have compassion uh, it you know patients come in they're scared to death the guy's coming at me with a needle um, you have to put them at ease and um, you, you so I don't, correct me if I'm wrong but I would say that 85 percent of what I do is is technical and scientific and the other 15 percent is to just to be able to communicate with a patient and to to help them to relax because, you know, it's, it's no fun to, to come see an oral surgeon 95% of the time unless it's your post-operative appointment. So, um, uh, yeah, th th it's really um, uh, Im important because uh, certainly in the United States it was always the kid from China who was the top of the class anyway. <laughs> so, um, the, I mean, you, you guys have the academic credentials. It's the 
um, that that social ability that that Dr. Payne's talking about that um, and the interacting. Um, I, I don't know that I would encourage them to all go play football, though. <laughs> so they're other, they're, they're good, they're good. They yeah, not yeah, help my business a lot, but but uh, it doesn't have to be a contact sport. But certainly that's another form of socialization and, and interrelations uh, that that would definitely help you uh, with the interviewing process uh, with uh, medical or dental school or any healthcare field. That's what I find out from uh, U.S. school. They stress stressed a lot on uh, patient communication patient education. So in the office, we have about 20 plus dentists. And then you can see who gets busy, who, who doesn't get as busy. The ones who can communicate with the patient gets busier. Because the patient doesn't know if your root canal is good or not. They, 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 they appreciate when you can explain to them what they need. Or they will only appreciate when, if it hurts or if it doesn't hurt. So if you can have a good patient manage management skill, it will help you to be more successful. Probably also a good listener. Yeah, good listener. You have to. Yeah, one of the things is you have to first listen before you start to start to talk to the patient. Listen to what they have to tell you, tell you first. So in, in the U.S. education, before just be, besides just the technical skill or the science that we have to learn in dentistry, is we, we stress a lot on uh, human behavior and uh, patient management. So which is a little bit different from the Hong Kong dental school. When you go to see. Uh, sometimes a dentist or in Hong Kong or some of the colleagues now practices, they don't talk to you. They just tell you what you need, what, how much you have to pay. <laughs> That's all. Well, I was also just going to add to that that it is very important that you that it's it is so much about the relationship and building the relationship and can you communicate with your patient? Do they trust what you're saying? And to be able to do that, if your head is in a book. 95% of the time, then you're not going to be able to have one-on-one -on -one eye contact with the person and be able to say, I'm sorry you feel bad and I'm taking your money and here's what we're going to do to make you feel better or to, to get to the next spot with your surgery or whatever it may be. And in order to do that, you have to be able to communicate and you have to be able to build that bond. And if you don't have any interest, if you don't have any sports or um, clubs or anything else that you can talk to a patient about, that you can get that bond where then they trust you, then, then you're not doing yourself any favors. You will not be able to enjoy what you do or be passionate about.